Welcome to our flip notes on groundwater. Hopefully you have the fill in the blanks for this. It'll make it go a little bit um, more quickly if you have the fill in the blanks, but you certainly don't need to have the fill in the blank notes to take the notes. And this is for the class. So if you're someone from the outside taking a look at these notes, these are meant for eighth grade students. And it's just a general introduction on groundwater. It's not meant to be you know, a high school level course or a college level course, just some basic um, facts about groundwater. So one of the first things I'd like to take a look at are some of the misconceptions out there. For example, a lot of people have the idea that groundwater flows mainly in underground rivers. And this is certainly false. Now there are some um, water that flows in underground streams, or you may find some, un un some underground lakes out there. But for the most part, groundwater moves very slowly through tiny spaces between particles and rocks and soil. How about this one? A lot of people believe that groundwater is not connected to rivers and lakes. And that is certainly false. Groundwater is connected to rivers and lakes and vice versa. This connection is usually through wetlands and springs. So, you know, if you're doing things in a lake, you know, or if you're pouring stuff into a river thinking it'll never get into the groundwater. Well, guess again, the two are connected. There is definitely a chance that you will be um, well, let's just say if you're pouring it in your neighborhood or if you live in a country and you're pouring it into a lake or a stream, there's a good chance that it will get into the aquifer and you will be drinking that up. A lot of people have the idea that contaminants from oil that is poured in the ground will be filtered by soil and gravel before reaching groundwater. There's this idea out there, which is false, that the ground will take care of everything. That whatever you pour through the ground, the soil will filter it out. And while the soil does do a nice job of filtering out lots of chemicals, and most of these chemicals are natural ones, it'll, it'll filter out bacteria, it'll filter out nitrogen compounds. But there are a lot of man-made items that the soils will not filter out. So you got to be careful with what you, how you dispose of items. You can't just go dump them into the, onto the soil. Most groundwater in the northern U.S. comes from Canada. This is one of those misconceptions that's out there, and a lot of people have this misconception. They look at Canada being to the north, so they always view as water flowing from the north to the south. And water doesn't necessarily flow east, south, west, north. It'll flow from a higher elevation to an area of lower elevation. For example, groundwater may flow into Lake Superior from any direction that is upslope from Lake Superior. If a well reaches groundwater, an unlimited amount of water can be pumped. All too often people think as long as they drill a hole, especially here in Wisconsin, as long as they drill a hole or a well, they're going to get an unlimited amount of water. But that's not always the case. So we're going to study groundwater. And the reason why we're going to study groundwater is that the earth is a closed system, which means there's the same amount of water here today as there was about 3 billion years ago. And some scientists are theorizing that this groundwater is renewed once every 1,400 years, which means the groundwater will flow through a cycle, and approximately 1,400 years will be completely replenished. Now, is that always the case? No. There's some groundwater that has been in the ground for um, probably th more than thousands of years, but maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, because they were, there's no wells in those areas that are pulling that water out. So what is groundwater? Groundwater is water that comes from underground, which is why they call it groundwater. And the major source of all freshwater drinking supplies in many countries is groundwater. So when you look at Wisconsin, we get a lot of our water from the ground or from groundwater. Now, there are some communities that may pull water out of the Great Lakes or from rivers such as the Wisconsin River, but a lot of communities do depend on groundwater. And when we look at this slide right here, you can see groundwater underneath the ground. And this right here, and we'll take a look at a lot of this vocabulary coming up, but you have the unsaturated zone, which is the area that is not saturated with water. The bottom of the unsaturated zone or the top of the saturated zone is known as the water table. And here you can see that connection between the surface water and the groundwater. A lot of times the top of your lakes, your rivers, your streams, that is the water table but it's not considered the water, top of the water table because it's not underground. So where is the, all this water? When you look at our planet, our planet is known as, you know, sometimes referred to as the blue planet or sometimes referred to as the water planet. But when it comes to actually drinking water, fresh water, there's not a lot of it. So here's a neat little chart right here where we see the oceans 
and when we look at 100% of the world's water, 97% is saline or it's in the oceans. It's in it's salt water, and only 3% is fresh water. And of that 3%, almost well, almost 70%. They say 68.7% here is locked up in ice caps and glaciers, and then groundwater makes up 30%. And so you look at all the Great Lakes, you look at all these rivers and streams, well, that's surface water. It's only about 0.3% of that 3%. So we can see, even though we are a water planet, well, most of that water is not drinkable water. So where do we use a lot of this water in Wisconsin? Here's a neat little graph where you can see that um, in the background, the darker blue is your groundwater and you got your surface water. Industry actually uses a lot of water, whether it's groundwater or surface water. And you can see that agriculture uses quite a bit and they use more of the groundwater than the surface water and a lot of that comes um, via irrigation. So groundwater is stored underground in what we call as aquifers and aquifers are highly vulnerable to pollution. So that's one of the reasons why we're going to study groundwater. We want to make sure that this resource, this valuable resource, is here for many, many years to go, um, come. So understanding groundwater, this process in aquifers, is crucial to the management and protection of this precious resource. So let's first talk about the hydrologic cycle. Sometimes this is called the water cycle. And this is the circulation of water on, in, and above the earth. And groundwater is just a small part of this continuous cycle. So here we can see through this diagram, and I apologize, I've transferred my notes into Google Docs, and this diagram is actually not working right now. But what you would see is you're going to see precipitation coming down. And once that precipitation hits the ground, several things are going to happen. One, that water could run off into lakes, rivers, and streams. It could evaporate back up. You can see the sun over here. It could evaporate back up into the atmosphere. Or, for example, if trees brought it up through the roots, it could transpire through the um, leaves. Or it could infiltrate or soak into the ground. So those are the three different things that groundwater can do or water can do once it hits the surface of the earth. Now this is a kind of a neat poster and you're actually going to look at this poster a little bit more closely in an activity we're going to do in the next few days. Now groundwater comes from precipitation. And precipitated water must filter down through the unsaturated zone. Sometimes this is called the Vidot zone. And it does this to reach the zone of saturation. If something is saturated, it has a lot of it. It's completely inundated with it. So the zone of saturation is completely filled with water. And this is where groundwater flow actually occurs. Now the Vidot zone has an important environmental role in groundwater systems. Surface pollutants must filter through this Vidot zone before entering the zone of saturation. So when we look back here, the unsaturated zone does not, is not saturated with water. Water will flow through it to reach the saturated zone. And another name for the unsaturated zone is the Vidot zone. And this zone is what filters out a lot of things. Now, in the beginning, we talked about how it doesn't always filter out things like oil or other pollutants. And usually a lot of these are man-made materials. But they're very good at filtering out fall. For example, let's say you go up behind a tree and you go pee. Well, you're not going to have to worry about it because if you live in a country, whenever you go to the bathroom, it goes into your septic system, which goes into a drain field. And the ground does it usually does a really good job of filtering that out so you don't have to worry about it. It's the non-natural things such as oil or other pollutants that we're worried about polluting the groundwater. So the rate of infiltration, how fast does it go into the ground? Well, there's really several things we have to look at. One, look at the soil type. We have to look at the rock type and we have to look at time, how much time is involved. And we're actually going to look at this a little bit more when we take a look at permeability and porosity. Now, the Vidot zone does include all the materials between the Earth's surface and the zone of saturation. And the upper boundary of the zone of saturation is actually called the water table. Now, the water table is not flat. When you think of groundwater, it's not, you don't just go down to one elevation and there it is. Water, the water table actually is a sloping surface. It mimics the topography of the earth. So if, if there's a big hill out there, if you're looking out your window and you see a big hill, more than likely the water table mimics that hill, just it's going to be underneath the ground. 
And an aquifer is a formation that allows water to be accessible at a usable rate. So an aquifer stores the water. But if you can't access the water, if, if, if it's not accessible, if you can't pull it up, it really isn't an aquifer. And aquifers are permeable layers such as sand, gravel, and fractured rocks. So we're going to take a break right here. And this is going to be part one. I'm trying to keep each of these videos really short. And in part two, we're going to take a little bit more of a look, more in-depth look at what aquifers are. And we'll take a look more at how groundwater flows. So as always, if you have any questions about any of these notes, please bring them up in class. Ask questions. I love it when students come up and ask questions about these videos. Thanks and goodbye.